just let's stick with um, Patterson. Um, mm -hmm. I know we kind of thought about John Brown, but let's let's give a head to Patterson because mm -hmm. I think that's another interesting aspect because you have Patterson and you kind of juxtapose Milroy, which you have done a lot of work on because you wrote books on the battles of Winchester. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> it's it's such a stark comparison between these two individuals. One of them has the Emancipation Proclamation that he can enforce, the other one, Patterson there in the early days of the Valley. He doesn't have that. He's sort of following the fugitive slave law. It's uh, mm -hmm. in kind of established federal laws that exist at this time. How, um, in part, how how does that shape sort of the perceptions in the valley of um, do do enslaved people walk away and kind of I'm like do these guys even know what they're doing here? Are they what? Why are they here for? Are they here for us? Um, yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So. I think there is this, you know, when the when the war breaks out, I think you have enslaved people, they sense that in some way this is going to impact them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, as I argue early on the book, you know, some individuals say, okay, war started, we're using this as the excuse to flee. Right. And there's a lot of, you know, newspaper evidence, um, you know, May, early June of 1861, before Patterson even shows up, of enslaved people, you know, making it to Harrisburg and coming in by the dozens every single day. And then you have planned insurrection that, you know, is, is crushed by Confederates and some are more pragmatic. But when Patterson came to the Valley, I think, you know, when, when enslaved people in Jefferson County and Berkeley County and Frederick County, the, the Northern reaches of the Valley, they thought, well, this is, this is our moment. You know, the United States soldiers are here we are going to have such a great opportunity to flee and we'll have protection and we'll have a new life. Right. And they were turned away. Mm -hmm. And, and there are these exchanges, you know, David Hunter Strother, who was from, who's from the Valley. He's a, a union officer, um, served, you know, f throughout most of the war until 1864. Um, he was from Martinsburg mm -hmm. and, and David Hunter Strother records these, these sort of very weird moments that enslaved people have where they encounter United States troops and they're saying, well, aren't you here to give us freedom? And they said, well, no, you need to return to your master. Mm -hmm. And so this was, this was very puzzling. Right. And, and I think this is one of those moments, you know, again, this is all before the first confiscation act. Um, and this is one of these moments where it's, it's puzzling for enslaved people because you have individuals who are, who are thinking, Union soldiers are going to free me. Right. That doesn't happen. What do I do now? Um, some of them will go back to their to their enslavers, but there are some who are undaunted, and there are some who believe that you know if they trade off military information to Patterson, he'll grant them a safe passage. You don't have to do anything; just don't don't arrest me. And you know that that fellow that I mentioned earlier, George, you know this was one of these individuals. Mm -hmm. So he, he knew the risk. He knew that Patterson um, would either immediately return him to his enslaver or lock him up in jail until he could be returned. Um, but George thought, I have this information about Joe Johnston's forces around Winchester. I'm going to provide that. And in the hopes that Patterson would let me go safely northward. And so George, you know, provided this information and then Patterson promptly arrested him after doing that. And so it, it creates a sense of, of great distrust mm. among enslaved people because, uh, I mean, clearly you can't trust Confederates. I mean, they're, they're not in this to make you free. And, you know, the soldiers who you think are here to help you by Patterson's directive clearly aren't. Yeah. But one of the other interesting things about this is that you have soldiers in Patterson's army who also think this is very bizarre. Um, you know, we shouldn't be doing this. They see the Valley's African-Americans as a great resource, um, either to, to just arm them now as soldiers or to at least use them in, in some capacity to gather information and intelligence about Confederate forces. So you have some, and I write about this in the, in the you know, early chapters of the book, where some of the soldiers in Patterson's command are basically undermining him. Um, and they're and they're defying the orders because they feel it's it's morally objectionable. I mean, Wilder Dwight from the Second Massachusetts thinks this is just so very odd. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and he's not gonna he's not gonna stand for it. He's gonna either turn a blind eye or willfully help uh, enslaved people uh, to get out of Virginia and to points north. So yeah, this is also I think one of those those aspects of the Civil War in the era in the Valley that people had had no awareness of at all. Right. Um, and it's just a, a, again a very very kind of confusing moment for for these enslaved people in the valley. 